Welcome back to our series on simulating the one-dimensional linear wave equation. We can see that we had our initial condition here of a pulse, which might be like if I violently pluck a string at one location, or maybe if I tap the surface of water and it sticks to my finger before I let go due to adhesion. So the next thing we'd like to do, if you remember back to the first video in this series, we saw in our wave tank... We have these circular ripples, and we would like to extend our code from our one-dimensional case up to two dimensions to make this closer to the physical system that we are interested in. The great thing about Python is how quickly we can modify something like a one-dimensional code that we already have into a two-dimensional code. We will see how quickly this works. The first thing I want to do is import one more module. I'm going to, from matplotlib, uh, import CM, that's a color map module. So this will allow us to do pseudo color plotting on, uh, on our three-dimensional plots of this two-dimensional wave. The next thing we want to do is we have defined our x variable here just to see what this looks like conceptually. Suppose I said that x equals np.a range of 5. And let me echo x. So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I have 5 grid points. And let's say y equals np.a range of 5. My y looks just like my x. Now what I'm going to do is something called tuple unpacking. I will say xx comma yy. So I have two outputs and those will be the result of np.mesh grid of x comma y. Let's take a look at what xx looks like now. So this is a two-dimensional array. That's an array of one-dimensional arrays. And we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. These are the x coordinates of the points that I've defined. Let's look at what yy looks like. Notice in xx, each column is the same number. In yy, each row is the same number. So this gives us a, a patchwork quilt to address each location in our two-dimensional array. So where previously we would have used x, like here on my line 27, uh, to define our initial condition, in our two-dimensional code, we're going to be using xx, the two-dimensional version of x, and we'll also use yy for functions that depend on y. So now that we've seen how these xx and yy work, let's define them into our code. Before we do that, I would like to save a copy, and I will call it 2D Wave Leapfrog. So here we've defined x. Let's copy that line, and we will define another array y. And then we'll say xx comma yy equals np dot mesh grid. I think style wise, I'd rather have no space there. np dot mesh grid of x comma y, and that will define our two dimensional system. So we've defined our coordinates. The next thing we'd like to do is make f our function that holds the height of the water in this case, or height of the string, displacement of the string from equilibrium. Uh, we will make this a three-dimensional array now. So it's endpoints by endpoints. That's x, y, and remember we have past, present, and future are the three layers in this three-layer cake of zeros. Next, for a Gaussian wave pulse here on line 30, uh, we have a slice now, layer zero. We need to add the second dimension for each time we see an array like this. And I'm going to make this xx, the two-dimensional version of x. And to make this a two-dimensional Gaussian, we're going to multiply by the same quantity, but with y's. So we will copy this and paste and replace the x's with yy's. Next, we'll move on to our time stepping. Wherever I have a 1 colon minus 1 in x, I'm going to also have a 1 colon minus 1 in y. And now along the x dimension, we're going to add a 1 colon minus 1 in the y direction because this, this quantity here, remember, represents a spatial second derivative we have our dx squared in the denominator here. And we're taking a derivative along x, which means y is going to stay constant. So other than our boundary cells, we are just addressing all of the y values as unchanging. So this is the idea of a partial derivative. Keeping y constant while taking a derivative along x, we have 1 colon minus 1 here for our y dimension. We'll use a line continuation character. Remember that in Python, when we use line con continuation, indentation does not matter on the next line. So we will take the same quantity, but we will exchange the roles of x and y with each other. 
So I'm going to have 1 colon minus 1 for x and colon minus 2 for y. Here I'm going to have 1 colon minus 1 for x and 2 colon for y. Notice we've just swapped the roles of x and y if I compare the expressions that are above each other. And here we're going to have, we have 1 colon minus 1 and 1 colon minus 1 for both x and y. So we have the same quantity in each case here. Now remember, because our first time step is special, we're stepping only half of the advanced quantity here. So if I take that, except for the 0.5, and copy here, that will be exactly what I need for my second x derivative term here. I'll use a line continuation character, paste again. We can line this up, and in this case we want not that quantity, but the quantity we developed for y in this case. And remember that where we used the zero time slice here in the first time step, we're going to use time slice one in every other step. So wherever I have a zero in my third layer here, I'm going to use one, the present time slice, rather than the past. Because after the first time slice, we have already filled in that row. And notice here that we need to add the second dimension, one colon minus one for y. Here we have one colon minus one, comma, zero, and one colon minus one, comma, one. Now anytime we're mentioning f and adjusting something, we need to make sure to make it two-dimensional everywhere. Three-dimensional array, two-dimensional space, and one dimension time. So we are just adding the y dimension here. Note that in this algorithm, we're never updating the boundary cells. We just have a fixed boundary, so we don't need to enforce the boundary condition. It will stay zero. Now the last thing we need to change is our plotting so that we can see what's happening in this two-dimensional system. So I'm going to get rid of my two-dimensional plotting, and I want to define an instance of axes subplot. So I'll say ax equals fig, my figure object here. Let's define, let's define fig to be our plot object. So here we will say fig.clf, clear figure, is what clf stands for. And we will define ax to be fig.add subplot. And the type for this will be projection 3D. Projection equals, as a string, 3D in single quotes there. Now we will add the surface plot that we want to see here. So we'll say ax.plot underscore surface. We need our spatial coordinates, so those will be xx, comma, y, y. And we want f of colon, comma, colon, comma, 2, our most up-to-date data at each time. And let's say our stride, so this is how far to step uh, in the grid. We can make this coarser or finer, but we'll, we'll plot all of the data for the time being. Our stride equals 1. That's the row stride. Now the column stride, c stride equals 1, and now we're going to use that color map module that we imported. cmap equals cm.coolwarm. This will show cool and warm colors for displacement above and below 0. Now, we don't need our x and y limb to be set in the way they were before, but let's set the z limit. So we will say ax.set underscore z limb 3D. Uh, this is a view that I have found to be a useful set of parameters. So we're going to have our z extend from negative 0.25 to 1. So our Gaussian wave pulse uh, will be above the zero. We'll have a little room below and plenty of room above to see the surface. And just like that, we have adapted the code to two dimensions in space and one in time, hopefully. Let's take a look at what it looks like. We have syntax error here. How do I debug? This is an important part of the process to see, line 37. We see on line 37, I have that comma that doesn't need to be there. And trying again, syntax error. We are on line 44. Let's check it out. Same problem, because I copied the code. Check that out. We are missing our plus sign here. Everything is lined up nicely again. And we'll give it another try. And there we go. So we can see our initial condition of a Gaussian pulse, which is now spreading out. Ah, and we have a numerical instability, so we need to reduce our time step. So my console here, I will just spam a control C to cancel the code. We need to make our time step a little bit smaller. Let's make it, since the wave can move diagonally, let's take root 2 over 2 of the time step, so 0 0.707, and that should give us nominal stability. Let's take a look. I see the wave pulse here spreading out. 
Now, in this case, we probably want to be more mindful of our boundary conditions, whether we implement something more sophisticated. Uh, but the simplest thing is to just not consider the system after the wave pulse reaches the boundary, as we probably have some unphysical effects there. But just like that, we have adapted our code to two spatial dimensions. So we've seen how to use this kind of pseudo-color surface plot. One other way you might want to visualize something in that kind of three-dimensional view, viewing a two-dimensional function, uh, we could have an ax.plot, and in this case, the type is wireframe, which is what it sounds like. We're going to have the same spatial arguments, xx, y, y. We're going to have the same function argument, f of everything in x, everything in y, and layer two. In this case, if I overlay a wireframe on top of my surface, let's make the rstride coarser. So we will say rstride equals 10, and cstride equals 10, consistent spacing here. And uh, color, let's choose something not in the palette. So we will say color equals green. And let's take a look at what that adds to our plot. cstride here, taking a look. Now you can see we have this overlay where we can see the shape of the function in another, another method of visualizing. So those are two ways to visualize our two-dimensional function, two spatial dimensions, one time dimension, in our 1D linear wave code with leapfrog time-stepping.